Okay, so uh, a very big welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are the Urban Forest Initiative, also known as UFI. Um, since 2014, UFI has been working in outreach and uh, education and research uh, to further the greater good by improving our urban tree canopy. One approach that we've used to strengthen is to strengthen the community in urban and community forestry by connecting different <coughs> entities with one another to uh, further common goals. And so uh, this synergy has worked quite effectively, and uh, the, the fact that you're all sitting here tonight is evidence of that. So we thank you. Um, so UFI is a core team of myself. My name is Lynn Risky Kinney. I'm a professor in forest entomology in the Department of Entomology. And uh, Mary Arthur, who is in the audience, uh, my co-lead. We also have uh, Nick Williamson, who is the UFI coordinator, as well as Michaela, uh, who is our outreach specialist as well as some awesome interns that have really been the, um, the horsepower of UFI over the, over the last few years. Um, so we've been super uh, lucky to have these interns that do all sorts of really uh, innovative and engaging work, and we're very thankful for them. But UFI is also a larger working group, um, and that consists of all these entities that are interested in furthering the urban tree canopy, um, whether they are public schools and colleges and universities in the region, uh, government agencies from local government to federal government, uh, as well as profits and nonprofits. And so we're extremely thankful to all of their engagement. Uh, one of the more high profile things that UFI does regularly is bring in this series of speakers. And so this is our first speaker of 2019. And so we're very excited to, to kick off the year. Um, but before I turn it over to our uh, speaker, I have a number of announcements, in fact, a very long list of announcements. Uh, first of all, CEUs. Uh, there are ISA and LA CEUs. Where are the sign up for those? Right here. Okay. So if you are in need of uh, signing up for CEUs, please find those individuals. Um, a couple of other announcements that we'd like to just put the plug in for. Um, most of you have probably heard of Trees Lexington. Uh, Trees Lexington is a nonprofit that is seeking to uh, expand the urban tree canopy in the Lexington area. Uh, and it's encouraging community members to take a very proactive uh, role in doing so. And so they've come up with a pocket nursery program. And so uh, there's literature on the back table there. And so if you feel that you are interested and able to contribute to improving Lexington Street Canopy by um, uh, involve, involving yourself in the pocket nursery program, uh, please be sure to sign up there because I think they're very much looking for participants. Um, I mentioned that UFI has been fortunate in our ability to mentor um, student interns and one of the ways that we've been able to do this is through formation of a student, a series of student teams called Tree Cats. Tree Cats are collegiate arborist teams and these tree cats are working with neighborhoods in Lexington to uh, assist them in inventorying their tree canopy, their street tree canopy, and mapping their trees. And so this will allow them then to compute the ecosystem services provided by those trees and help identify um, uh, approaches to manage those trees most effectively. So if you are interested, your neighborhood is interested in having the tree cats visit and help you uh, with a street tree inventory, uh, there's sign-up sheet in the back table there. Um, so there are a lot of uh, upcoming UFI-sponsored events that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first is our film night. Uh, so in addition to these speakers, we uh, have one night a year where we have films that are relevant to urban trees and urban uh, and community forestry. And so this year, we're developing a series of short films that will focus on various facets of urban and community forestry and the ways in which they benefit uh, ecosystem services, but also our communities as a whole. And so that will be sometime in March. March 6th, I believe, is one of the film dates, and there will be two showings. So please keep your eyes peeled for, um, uh, for those announcements. Our second upcoming event is um, our, uh, we're working towards bringing in an author and journalist named uh, Florence Williams, who wrote uh, the book 
uh, published in 2016 called Nature Fix, Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. So we're still working out the details of, of the Florence William visit. Uh, it will either be in April or in next fall, um, but please uh, stay tuned for information on that event as well. So uh, the connection between nature and human wellness then is a perfect segue into tonight's speaker, uh, Chris Chandler of the Nature Conserv Conservancy. And he's going to teach us about the really impressive program that Louisville has developed to not only improve their urban tree canopy, but also to measure and document the effects that those changes will have on human wellness. So Chris is a native of Louisville, and he has degrees in communication and anthropology from the University of Louisville. But he has over 10 years experience as a project manager and business developer for ecological consultants and, uh, and NGOs in the Louisville area. Uh, importantly, he has a proven track record of successfully working with private landowners, government agencies, policymakers, community-based organizations, and academics to help build healthy natural systems in and around the Louisville area. So Chris is a certified arborist and also serves in leadership <coughs> positions with local nonprofits and community-based environmental organizations. He has a passion for connecting conservation work to public health, and so he's a natural spokesperson for Louisville's Green Heart Project. So please welcome me and join me, join me in welcoming you. I'm jealous. Lexington has it going on here. We do not get together like this in Louisville and talk tree talk. So you guys, that round of applause should be for you all because this is amazing. Um, we're going to start by just showing a little video, like a three minute short video. Um, I can figure out. Get out. Nikki did such a great job setting me up. This is just to kind of ground you in place with what's going on in Louisville. Go ahead and fire away. Doesn't sound good. It's pretty white in Louisville. And <laughs> Concerned about survival. We don't have. Mm. All right, we might scratch this. Tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it was a nice try. Well, what Councilwoman Sherry Bryant Hamilton's trying to say here is. Um, <coughs> You know, Louisville has a lot of diverse neighborhoods, a lot of diverse culture and communities, and oftentimes portions of the community don't have the luxury to think about sustainability, the urban forest, getting involved in tree care initiatives. They're worried about surviving. Um, they're worried about putting food on the table, having a safe and healthy space to raise their family and their children in. And as they begin to tap into the science of the community, they're learning more and more about the role that the environment plays, as well as the social determinants on their health. And um, so the communities are really on their own coming to, to the conservation community and to the urban forest community to try to find ways to tap into these initiatives because it's about the health of their communities and they're recognizing the role that nature plays. Uh, and that it's not just a nice to have, a, a nice thing to have, but it's a it's a must have, and it's a pretty compelling <coughs> narrative. So I'll share it to with Lynn, and if anybody wants to get a link to the video, we'd be glad to uh, to share it with you because 
it's told from the community perspective, which not often do big conservation organizations tell stories from the community perspective. It's usually a top-down approach. So we really, uh, we're really sad we can't share that with you tonight. Well, I'm Chris Chandler. I'm the Director of Urban <laughs> Conservation for the Kentucky Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And I love my job. Now, I'm not just saying that because my boss is sitting here in the front row with this lovely yeah. family, the Pemister family here. I truly love my job. I think that nature has given, provided me the, all of the best opportunities, the blessings of my life. My entire experience in life, my profession, my family. I met my wife hiking on the Appalachian Trail in the middle of Maine. You know, if it weren't for a nature-based experience, I wouldn't have the family I have, the beautiful children I have, and the job I have that allows me to wake up every day and think about ways to bring nature back into the community that I call home, the community I was born and raised in, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where I've spent most of my life, and where we return to raise our children because Louisville feels home. And I, you know, I fell in love with nature at the age of seven, exploring an undeveloped woodlot owned by a church that my parents' property backed up next to. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I remember it was fall. The leaves were dry. It was that smell of fall, crisp, like drying leaves and the crunch under your feet. It was probably seven or eight. We were swinging from grapevines. That's when I knew that like, that was a comfortable, safe space for me where I really wanted to spend my time. And, um, and from that exploration on, from that little undeveloped wetland woodlot behind the church, to standing here today and talking about the work we're doing at the Nature Conservancy here in Kentucky, um, I owe it all to nature. So that's why I say I love my job. I work for an organization like many of you do. You give your time, your talent, or your treasure to, to this urban conservation movement here in Lexington or wherever you're working or, or live. And it's an honor and a privilege. So that's why I say I love my job. Um, so who's heard of the Nature Conservancy? Anybody in this room? Oh my God, <laughs> David! This is, oh, yeah. this is amazing, <laughs> and nobody in Louisville's heard of us. So uh, you guys are another reason why Lexington is amazing. Um, I, you know, our, our our headquarters in Kentucky are here on Woodland Avenue, so we've we've had a presence in Lexington for many years. But uh, so I don't have to tell you much about this. We can skip over all this. We're a global environmental conservation organization. We're a pragmatic organization. We're science-based, solutions-oriented, and we're non-confrontational. And I think that's a pretty important um, uh, ethic that we carry with us and we have since the beginning. We were founded out of a group in the 50s of concerned scientists uh, at a time when the land trust movement had yet to really be born in the U.S. and we were concerned about the role that humans were playing on the environment. And so we got out and tried to find scientific ways to, to preserve natural landscapes, essentially from the impacts of people. And we've, if you see the numbers here, we were very successful. We grew to all 50 states. We went beyond land conservation to uh, freshwater systems and marine systems. We're, we're showing up globally in over 70 countries with projects touching down. Um, and in Kentucky, we've been around for nearly 45 years here, working in the Palisades here near the Lexington area to large wetland restoration, significant wetland restoration in Western Kentucky. Now we're in the Central Apps, working with many partners here in the room tonight, looking at kind of locking in large landscape uh, tracks. Um, and we, so we take a systems-based approach to what we, we do, and, and we partner with everyone. We, um, we rarely tackle an initiative by ourselves. So we love trying to find ways to add capacity to community-based organizations and local organizations to, to scale the work to transformative scales. Um, and you may think, well, why is the Nature Conservancy in cities? Why are we here learning about what they're doing in Louisville? You know, we've, we've had this wonderful track record of saving nature from the effects of humans. And, um, and we've kind of really realized that while that's a very important approach that we need to continue doing, um, there's some megatrends that are occurring. We're, we're in the midst of an urban century, this 21st century, uh, is a remarkable century with unbelievable changes in technology and in the way people move across the communities and across the world and the environment, the way we interact. And, uh, and the population projections are just astounding. These are UN projections. You know, a lot of folks have heard these numbers. By 2050, another two and a half billion people on the planet. 
and they're moving into cities. <coughs> so this is 2010, this is 2050, with nine and a half billion people projected. So everything in yellow is over 50% of populations living in urban environments. Everything brown is over 75%. So we're in the midst of the largest on-land migration the planet has ever seen, and it's people moving into cities. And there are some just staggering numbers. Um, nearly three million people move into a city every week. It's almost, you know, every other day a million people migrating into a city. Uh, and that trend is expected to continue through at least 2040. So it's an unbelievably unprecedented migration of folks. If you go back to the map, you see, you know, China, India, Russia, Europe, uh, Africa. These are these are mega trends happening. Even in the U.S., we're going to see lots of population growth. I don't know what the population projections are for Lexington, Fayette County um, by 2030, 2050, but we're looking at several hundred thousand more in Louisville by 2030. Um, so. So 70% of the global population is going to be projected to be living in cities. Cities only occupy about 10% of the global land mass, but they harness 80% of the resources that the world produces to feed them, provide energy, power, food, water. So, um, you know, at the Nature Conservancy, we're really excited to think about a lot of people living in cities because we've been working really hard to lock up lots of, you know, natural areas and keep them intact in their, in their functioning systems. So to think about really dense urban environments and developments in the future is really exciting to us, but we know that these places have to be hospitable urban environments, otherwise that this great experiment, this great migration is probably not going to work well. Um, and this is an interesting number, 5 trillion, so the, the World Economic Forum released this report recently that says 5 trillion dollars needs to be invested every year and through 2030 in, in infrastructure investments in cities to meet this, this bulging demand of people. Um, we know we're all struggling with crumbling, antiquated, outdated infrastructure, whether it's power, how we get our water, how we manage our storm water, or our, uh, our sanitary water in our communities, um, transitions from different energy sources. Um, this is a significant, this is, this is an amazing opportunity in this urban era to, to rethink how cities function. And that's why the Nature Conservancy is really excited to think about the role that nature and natural systems play in our environment, not just for their sake, but for their, the ability for nature to enrich the lives of us showing up in cities. So a little over four years ago, TNC decided we're finally getting into the urban game. And Kentucky was proudly one of the founding uh, chapters in the 50 states in the United States to plant the flag in an urban environment and say, we're willing to take this chance and to get into the urban uh, into the urban space and to just figure out what we're going to do. So Louisville was the city that Kentucky selected to be the first city to pilot this work. We had no roadmap, no, uh, no guidebook, but the, the Conservancy hired folks from all over the country at the same time to begin this work. It was initially 10, now the network has grown to over 20, about 24 in the U.S. and we have a global cities program, so we're, we're showing up in uh, several other countries and scoping you know, India, Europe, um, Latin American regions as well right now. So we're taking this work globally. And we work in a network fashion, so it's really, really great. We've got lots of different content leaders, whether it's folks that are urban forestry minded or folks down in Miami that are looking at coastal resiliency and storm surge and the role that mangroves can play to really strict biodiversity type of outcomes in Chicago. Um, so it's a great diverse palette of work. And we work together to find content leaders from different geographies to help us out when we need that, that help, which is really exciting. And the lens that we use to view all of this work is a lens through e of, e of equity. So who stands to gain the most from nature-based services in the city, and how do we prioritize through that lens our work? Um, that was a, a, just a, a key you know, a keystone of the way TNC set up our work. And we didn't really have the muscle to do that. We, we have a lot of great people relationships with indigenous tribes throughout other parts of the world. We know how to sit on the rocking porch here in the rock castle and work on land deals. But showing up in the urban space where we've never shown up before was a different beast for us. And so we actually partnered with some, some external organizations, some thought partners, to help us think through, to learn these skills around dialogue and active listening and 
um, and learning, you know, uh, heritage narratives of communities um, and finding ways to allow communities to lead the conversation. So let's bring this into Louisville. If you guys know Louisville, it's a pretty great community, thriving community for arts and for culture and music like Lexington. Uh, we, we top a lot of great lists, um, but we also top a lot of lists that folks in city government don't like to look at and don't like to draw attention to. Um, the American Lung Association has given us an a F for the last eight years in a row. Um, sorry, something's going on the slide here. The, uh, the City Commission and Urban Tree Campy Assessment that was completed and delivered five years ago that documented that we were losing about 54,000 trees per year annually. Um, and showed some historic trends of loss of our urban tree canopy. Uh, that does not take into account the devastating effects of the emerald ash borer, the EAB, which is thought to be about 15% of our canopy. So add double that number, and that's what we're losing every year, if not more. Um, and it, it did a pretty decent job of making the economic case for the role that the urban forest was playing, and even a prescriptive path as to where we might have opportunities to steward and enhance the, the urban forest. And it put some price tags on it that were, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to billion dollars over the coming decades investment that the urban forest resource needed. We're the fastest growing documented urban heat island city in the country. We're not the hottest city, Phoenix is, but we're warming per decade at twice the rate of Phoenix. Um, we've got pretty lax tree protection ordinances. Um, and we have just ep epidemic health crisis. We're in the coronary valley, as Louisville has been called, we have far rapidly exceeding, uh, uh, you know, standards. I'm um, sorry, um, uh, the averages of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity, well above the, the norms. Um, we're one of the worst cities to live in in the country. Routinely ranked that if you have asthma. So something about the air in Louisville is polluted, and it's driving some significant health outcomes. And there are certain neighborhoods in Louisville that have a life expectancy that's 13 years shorter than a neighborhood maybe a mile and a half away. And when you begin to overlay that, those are the urban heat island neighborhoods that have the hottest heat. Um, those are the areas that have the stormwater issues on average. Those are usually low income, economically challenged, environmentally overburdened communities that have highways blasting right through the middle of them. They back up the industry. Um, and they have the smallest, the least amount of tree canopy. So, you know, TNC came to the table a couple of years ago and tried to talk to all the community partners and did an exhaustive stakeholder analysis and tried to figure out how can we not put band-aids on the urban forest? How do we actually get resources we need to scale this work across the community and find the communities that, that need trees and prioritize the resources to begin retraining these communities? And at the same time, we, we learned that we had this amazing researcher in Louisville by the name of Dr. Aruni Bhatnagar at the University of Louisville. And he's a research cardiologist. And he wrote the book um, on environmental cardiology. And David and I met with him pretty early on when, when we were getting into the, the urban conversation. And we'd never heard of those two words put together. It was just fascinating. And, and so we got to talking with him about a, a real rigorous study to try to look at like what are the what is the opportunity to connect the dots to health, which is a, a critical issue in our community. Lots of folks are trying to tackle this issue, whether they're corporate, you know, partners, healthcare folks who are based in Louisville, in city government, all looking at health equity. What role does nature play, and what does the literature really say about it? And the literature is pretty good on the observational front, and it tells us what we, we all in this room know, that we feel better when we're in nature, and you know, there's lots of great studies that demonstrate Proximity to urban green space and urban forestry has all these great outcomes, but there those are all observational studies There is no causal link in any literature that demonstrates the mechanism that trees play in improving health outcomes And moreover, there's you know, there's no dose So if we could understand the mechanism then maybe we can understand the dose response curve and we can understand What dose of nature do you need and what are the specific health outcomes? So Dr. B, as we call him, is, you know, he's researching diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. He's a gold standard researcher with the National Institutes of Health. He's brought in $60 million in funding to do all kinds of stuff. And never has he or anyone gone to NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and asked for money to study trees. And it was the first time that anyone had. It took us almost three years, three submittals, to get them to approve a relatively small grant for, for Dr. B standards, you know, a little over $3 million to try to tackle this. 
but it gave us an enormous support to think the National Institutes of Health are willing to kind of join us in this journey. Uh, and the, the whole idea is the air in Louisville's toxic. We have very high levels of, of ground level ozone. We're not meeting the federal standards on ozone. And we have really pretty high levels of PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5, which is a really fine form of pollution that's mainly from transportation sources, diesel and industry and, and autos. And, um, and that, through all of Dr. B's work over decades, he's driving diabetes, obesity, and heart disease in, in lab animals and mice by just exposing them to ambient air off the streets from downtown Louisville. You know, the arc of his body of work, which he's now launched an institute called the Envirome, the play off the genome, um, is that the environmental determinants of health are driving illness, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, 60 to 80 percent preventable. These are not, we're not predestined to have this outcome as a species. This is, this is a reaction, a response in our bodies to the environment. So what we're trying to do is crack that nut. Can we design nature-based interventions and do a, a rigorous before-after study design to track participants from the neighborhoods, from the community, to see if we can figure out if we can change health outcomes and what the, the measure is, what the metric is. Is it air quality or is it attitudes and perceptions and, and stress, psychosocial factors? Um, so that's what the Green Heart Project is, this longitudinal study to tackle that. If anybody's been to Louisville, um, this area here is Churchill Downs. So we're in South Louisville, we're the gateway to South Louisville. This is a set of four neighborhoods. Uh, they're low-income communities. The average household median income is around $26,000. Um, they're small, old shotgun houses. They have a pretty high uh, percentage of owners, interestingly, who've owned for more than seven years, uh, which is something important to us because we want to do a community-wide greening. We need to be able to talk to leaders. So that was a part of why we were here. We need to talk to who owns the land. Um, it's got a major highway, that big uh, west-east cutting highway is the, the inner beltway, the Watterson Expressway 264, cuts right through these neighborhoods. Sections do not have sound barriers or any other buffer between residential properties backing right up to it. Um, so this is the study area. So the idea is to prescribe greening interventions, to inject massive greening into portions of all four, five, actually five neighborhoods, and then in portions of those neighborhoods to not deliberately plant and to track the health of the, the ecology, of the community, of the social and fabric and the social capital, as well as the health endpoints with the population of people living in the neighborhood. So our end for this is 700. We need 700 participants to, to enroll. 350 will be cited, the, the greening interventions will be cited near 350, and then 350 will not have deliberate greening interventions, and it will be a part of the control sample uh, population. To date, we've enrolled 431 folks, so we have, we have to resume in the spring. We're only enrolling folks when we have full leaf expansion, when the trees that are existing there are, are working and doing their thing. They're primarily deciduous species. So at the end of September, we, we, we stopped enrollment, and we'll resume enrollment with full leaf expansion kind of after Derby. We're not going to do anything until Derby happens. Um, it's just too crazy to get in the neighborhood and do anything else. This is not a very great rendering, because I don't know that I would want my front yard to look like that. But, um, but the idea here is this is a sound barrier. The expressways here, we have a lot of roads and alleys that back up to the sound barrier. A lot of residents that have little to no canopy. Um, and this is just a kind of a, a rendering that one of our, our partners did who's doing the design work um, to begin to figure out what types of vegetation do we need to think about um, to create what we're calling biofilters. How do we design native suites of vegetation that, uh, that mimic native plant communities and that give pretty good coverage from kind of ground level to a higher level um, to absorb air pollution. So how do we design these buffers to act as air filters, to, to have maximized leaf surface area that can capture the air pollution nearest the source, so along a major roadway. Um, it can just simply capture it on a hairy leaf follicle where it just remains there, maybe until it rains, where it would just run off, or through the stomata of the tree where it's absorbed and turned into, you know, woody mass in the tree. 
Um, we did a pilot project at a school, a Catholic school on Shelbyville Road, across the street from all the malls in Louisville, uh, called St. Margaret Mary, and we did this in the fall, where we just tested everything. We tested our partnership. Like, who steps up, who steps back? How do we work together to understand air quality modeling and monitoring, to understand community engagement and outreach, to understand what's the clinical research strategy and what's the greening strategy, and how do all these teams come together to, uh, to actually implement a project. So we did a, a project, on the left is before the planting, on the right is after, we planted about 125 trees. We spaded 10 inch caliper eastern white pines that were 30 feet high end. I mean, we're not gonna do that all over Greenheart, but we had a huge wide green verge, 60,000 cars a day go by here, and there's a school right there that has relatively no vegetation. So we set this up, we, we enrolled students, 40 students and 20 faculty and folks who worked, adults who worked at the school, and did blood, urine analysis before the, the greening intervention. This went in in October, all the deciduous trees were dormant already when they were planted. Um, and then started a series of post follow-ups. All the while we've been monitoring the air quality, understanding porosity, and what does air pollution do when it hits this? Does it go through it or under it or over it? And what kind of porosity do we need? That's getting f fed into fluid, computational fluid dynamic models to further tell us if we were doing a big buffer along a big federal highway where we have a bunch of space, what, how do we maximize leaf surface area to act as a filter? Now we can't do that on a little residential property. We're not gonna do some over-engineered greening buffer. That's gonna be more about community-based plantings in front yards and backyards and along alleys. But where we have these big greening opportunities, and what we saw was um, under certain wind conditions, the wind was really shifty there, but under essentially the conditions where the wind would come through, um, I don't know, where the wind would come through the buffer, we would see 60% reductions, up to 60% reductions in, um, in particulate matter, which is significant. You look at all the David Nowak, you know, U.S. Forest Service uh, papers, observational papers on like trees' ability to remove PM, and it's somewhere around... 5%, 7%, it's never been really considered as a real strategy because it's thought to not be robust. Thank you, Nick, you keep me, you keep me in line. Um, we were seeing up to 60% reductions and we were seeing some significant um, stress level endpoints, especially on the children with the type of uh, clinical trial that we piloted, the type of endpoints that we were looking at uh, in the urine analysis and in the blood analysis showed a, essentially a significant reduction in immunity production. Which I thought, well that doesn't sound good. If your immunity production is lowering, is that good? And it actually meant the body was less stressed. So it was angiogenetic progenitor cells, um, which are a biomarker for, um, for inflammation and for stress, were significantly affected. And this was, that first sampling was a month after we planted the trees. Half of the trees were dormant. Right, so the filter wasn't even really functioning all that well. There was a lot of probably excitement with the kids because they came out and helped plant some of these trees, not the big ones, but you know, they were involved in getting their hands dirty. So uh, we're not, you know, it was, it was mind blowing to see very initial, you know, high, you know, really interesting clinical outputs and you know, this, this extensive air quality modeling since and monitoring since those initial follow-ups have really proven that we, we think we can remove PM up to 60% if these things are sited the right way under the right wind conditions nearest these sources. Therefore, making the air pollution less available to be, to be um, taken in by the community. So that pilot project has provided an enormous amount of work. It's getting published um, really actually pretty soon, and I'm not sure the journal, but I'll figure it out and share it with anybody that's interested. Um, our, the PI, Dr. B, is doing force baiting research to figure out what specific um, emissions from specific tree species might have an effect on cortisol levels or on you know, blood and urine you know, metabolites. So we're trying to actually truly understand, is there some science behind force bathing? Can we understand what chemical VOC is being emitted, B BVOC, that may have some beneficial effect? So that's going to feed into our work, and that cohort has been going from Louisville to Colorado, and they're going to go to the Amazon to, to, to hit different biomes to figure out different, different types of forest and how does that affect human health. We flew hyperspectral survey imagery of the project area, which was super cool. I've never done anything like this, to map every tree 
And this was a fixed wing aircraft that flew with LIDAR. Um, we, there was an extensive ground survey to create the training data to, uh, to begin to extrapolate across the full scope of the area we flew. We flew four square miles, which is the target and the intervention together. The target area is about two square miles where we're intervening and planting, and then two square miles of control. Um, so we know the, the, the main like five or six genuses, and then we know the health of them. Is it a healthy ash, a fair condition ash, or a declining ash? Because we don't just want to plant new trees and see the health effects, we want to steward the existing forest resource. So it was cool we were able to take that data, figure out where are all the ash trees in the community, go do kind of extensive windshield surveys to determine which ash trees are still viable candidates for treatment against the emerald ash borer. We were able to treat over 100 trees on public property and private property through cooperative agreements with individual landowners working with a community-based organization, uh, Louisville Grows, to facilitate that work. And the average uh, DSH of the, of the ash we treated was 25 inches. These are mature, established, overstory canopy trees. We treated 70 plus inch DVH ash trees that were still healthy. So it's not just about planting new trees, it's about forest health and all the outreach of the community. Um, and the community was super excited about that. They knew their trees were dying. They didn't know why, but they could tell. Um, and it was an immediate, you know, great connection point to just begin to dialogue with the community. Um, and so we're willing to pay to treat all of these trees for the next five years. Um, and, and we've done all this outreach so that the neighbors know that five years from now, it's kind of going to be on them, you know, to continue the stewardship of keeping that tree alive. Or at least they won't be caught off guard if seven years from now that tree is dead, they'll have at least the knowledge to be able to, to game plan that. And again, these communities, they don't have $2,000 sitting around in a rainy day fund to remove my hazard ash tree in my yard. You know, it's, it's just simply not within the, the reach of the community. Um, so, so here's where we are now. This is a five-year study. Um, we're wrapping up year one of full baseline assessments. So, unbelievable amount of community engagement, thousands of doors getting knocked on, a huge cohort of community champions, restaurant nights, community health fairs, you know, whatever the community says we're interested in, we try to find a way through our networks or through our direct ability to add capacity to do that. Um, we've enrolled the 420, uh, 31 folks to take part in the, in the clinical research. We're going to have some design drawings probably in the next couple of weeks to begin outreach with the community around what do these greening interventions need to look like, how do we co-create from what the science says it needs to look like to what you want in your neighborhoods, in your right-of-ways, in your front yards, along <coughs> parks and parkways, and on you know, in houses of worship, sacred communities, campuses, uh, and commercial properties. We're, we're not seeking easements on any of this. This is an investment into the community and has to be co-driven, led by the community to help us site where all these trees are gonna go. We've been monitoring the air quality extensively. It's a pretty hard to see image, but this was a drive. So we have mobile monitoring platforms that, that extensively track you know, black carbon, PM, VOCs, NOx, SOx, all, you know, all kinds of different health endpoints. And so that's an actual picture of a drive, a scan of the neighborhood um, during rush hour one morning. So you can begin to see hotspots of like where air pollution is, is more concentrated. And we're doing this for season, we're doing it in the morning, during the day, in the evenings, on weekends. So we're really painting not just a, an ambient air map like on one day driving through the community, but throughout the seasons, where do these, do these hot spots change? How do we begin to site our greening interventions around that? We have passive air samplers that get deployed on utility poles, 60 of them. They sit out for two weeks and then get analyzed, and we do that every month. Um, and we're going to be turning on a, uh, a continuous fixed site monitor on a 30 meter tower that'll have a full meteorological station and that'll be a fixed site that just 24 seven is running at that elevation at that same site. And we're gonna publish real time to a community facing website all of that data. It'll be on a couple minute lag. So folks in the community can tie in anytime and see well, what's, what's going on meteorologically or from an air quality standpoint. Um, just sharing maps like this with community folks you know, folks have said, well, I run at that time of day down that corridor. I'm gonna have to figure out a different path, you know? So it's really remarkable just to see how taking science and just a basic image like this can start a conversation with the community. Um, we think we're gonna plant somewhere around 8,000 trees 
plus or minus, we're going to plant shrubs, probably native grasses and forbs. Uh, we're going to begin that planting this fall. We've got a stretch goal to get a couple thousand trees in the ground. It's going to take a village to do it. Um, and <coughs> carrying over into next spring, the planting season through the winter into next spring, wrapping up fall 2020. So we want to have all the intervention completed, kind of starting this fall and ending next fall. Uh, and then we sit back and steward these trees, uh, water, prune, mulch, love, talk to them, be with the community, steward the community, and then come back a couple of years later and do all of the, of the blood, urine, uh, attitudes, perceptions, survey analysis that, we, that we're doing with the enrollees before the intervention on the back end. Um, so the core partners here, the University of Louisville, Dr. B is the principal investigator of this work. He launched the Environ Institute at the University of Louisville uh, just this year, which is really exciting. And they're doing a lot of innovative work. And this is one of their kind of flagship projects. The, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Dr. Jay Turner is leading all the air quality monitoring. So he is just a phenomenal roadside air quality monitoring expert. And so he's leading that team. The Hyphy Design Lab, which some of you here in Lexington, I think at UK, have met some of those folks as, as they've come around to the tour of the Urban Design Studio and, and other departments here at UK. Um, they're ecology designers who really are trying to figure out plant communities and how to connect the, the design of native plant communities and how those communities interact with each other to some of this you know, amazing modeling type work that, that we're doing to try to create the designs. Um, we've got Cornell that is doing the, the fluid dynamic modeling. UC Berkeley is weighing in on the, the air quality. Uh, I'm sorry, Berkeley uh, is weighing in on the air quality monitoring. Uh, study design, U.S. Forest Service on with social scientists looking at, uh, at the psychosocial factors. So they helped us build out the, uh, the extensive survey with the attitudes and perceptions, questions around greenness and trees that, uh, that the enrollees are taking part in. And, you know, the idea behind all this is, I mean, it's pretty simple. There's nobody that's going to write hundred millions of dollars worth of checks in Louisville or Lexington for our Urban Tree Campy initiatives. And we know that that's what it's going to take over the coming decades to actually steward and manage the long-term succession of our urban forest. It's not what I thought we were going to be doing. I don't think David and I thought that we were going to be doing big time health, human health research, connecting nature to that work. But we see this as, as an opportunity to unlock billions of dollars for our work that we're not able to capture. You know, it's kind of the holy grail of ecosystem nature-based services. We're pretty good at understanding carbon and stormwater and property values, and we've got some good tools that we can fight over the outputs of, but you know, we've got tools to begin to understand that. We don't know the role it plays on our health. And less than 3% of money of global forestry is going into trees, conservation, zoos, sustainability, less than 3%. You know, if we're going to crack the nut of, the, of that pie, if we're going to crack who is at the table, who's funding our work, who's taking this work seriously, we're going to have to think in new ways. And we really think that the human health connection is, is a huge possible opportunity to, to tie in new stakeholders and new partners to take this work to transformational scales. And TNC's really excited about that, to think about you know, the thousand other cities around the world that have air quality issues, just like Louisville and Lexington, and the ideas around open source uh, replicability that is a part of all of the, the work we're doing as this collaborative, to inspire other communities to create new blueprints or green prints for how they can maximize their return on their investment if they're making investments in urban tree canopy initiatives, how to tap into new resources to do that. Um, if you're a major employer in Louisville, like Ford or EPS, and you employ 20,000 people who live in an environmentally overburdened community and miss work and uh, are expensive to insure, maybe it's in your. Maybe there's a great return on your investment to start putting money into creating safe, healthy communities for your, your team members. Um, the insurance providers who are looking at, at, at uh, plans for payment, at how they get reimbursed. Um, they're keenly interested in this. So we happen to have 1,600 Humana uh, covered lives in our project area. Humana is deeply interested in tracking the before and after results on claims. So they can begin to wrap their mind around 
What's the ROI on this? I did it again. I don't know what I'm doing here, Nick. Oh, there we go. Um, so, I mean, we see these as, I mean, obviously, for, from a certified arbor standpoint and an ecology background, like, it's fascinating to take the conversation in these directions. And, uh, and we think there's a real opportunity to unlock a lot of money to begin investing in our communities that we're just, this movement isn't getting. We're just not doing it yet. Um, so we're really excited to think about how Lexington can learn from what we're doing, how we can share everything <coughs> we're doing, what's not working, what's working. How do you work with community to do this long term? What does it take to build a, that, those relationships? How do you work with corporate partners to get them thinking about these types of investments that they haven't you know, made historically? So, um, so it's a fascinating experience. David can attest to it because he's, he's in the front seat on all of this work. It's an enormous uh, undertaking, the stewardship of the partnership itself, of all these different teams and who's doing what and the interdependencies is a project in and of itself. Hmm. But we're working with folks that we've never really worked with before. And, and we're all excited about the outcomes that we could be driving towards with, with new learnings with this work. So it's exhilarating while also exhausting. And um, I think we're fortunate to have this urban laboratory be in Kentucky, where we're leading on a study that, frankly, that there's never been a study like this anywhere in the world. And to have it happening in Kentucky, of all places, I, I couldn't be more proud. And when I think about, um, I think about every urban kid in our community, they deserve to have the same opportunities to have nature inspire their lives and their trajectory and the health outcomes that they have that I have had. And so I'm really excited about that equity piece and, and beginning to focus this work in communities that need it the most and provide those opportunities for folks to, to join this conversation that is slowly getting more and more diverse every day and needs to continue on that path. So, um, so something else that isn't in the slides, but we're just now beginning to scratch the surface of is, is green jobs training. You know, we don't want out-of-state license plates coming in to Louisville to do this work. How do we capacity build community-based organizations to take to tackle the heavy lifting that this work is going to require and the stewardship that this work is going to require for years? And we're getting amazing interest from you know the Metro United Ways and the youth builds and you know and the tree organizations who all have some form of curriculum or of an idea of a program that just needs a little bit of cash injection or a little bit of extra collaboration with another community-based group to take to scale to be able to, to help us do this work. So I, I think that that's one of the most exciting developments that's coming out of recent is to think about how can we co-create with the community a meaningful jobs training program that gets folks the skills they need long after we're gone with the research to enter into this field, whether it's to be a certified arborist and work for a tree company or to go on to higher educational aspirations. So with that, I'm going to stop. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I would love to take questions because I'm sure you guys probably have a few questions about what we're doing.